today we pick up the theme of walking humbly with God. And before we get to that, let's just explain what that means, to walk humbly with God. It means that you recognize that everything in God's word is right. Whether you understand it or not, we say amen to it. Walking humbly with God means also that we ask him for understanding if there's something you don't understand. James tells us in James 1.5 that the Lord liberally and freely gives understanding if you ask him to anyone who doesn't understand his word. And he says he won't be angry with you, he upbraideth not. So there's no excuse, and you'll see where we're going in today's message, there's no excuse for any human being whether you have the word of God or not, because he's written it on the consciences of even people who never heard of God. We'll get to that in a minute, because Romans references it. But the Lord tells us through his word that walking humbly with him means knowing whatever he has blessed you with, whatever you know, whatever you have, whatever skills you uh, possess, whatever attributes or talents, God gave them to you. Walk humbly, don't be arrogant. And walking humbly with God, as I started off by saying, it means, first of all, this most of all, the word of God is right. Whether you understand it, whether it seems complicated to you, it is always to be said amen to. So the word of God is right. Walking humbly means you're not relying on your own wisdoms. You're relying on what God has already laid out. You know, the matter of the, the, the whole idea of worshiping God doesn't depend on individual taste. God accepted worship, godly living has already been set down in the word. And you'll see when we get to it today, God's whole point is, I've already told you, there's no excuse for anyone not knowing what he wants. And as I alluded to earlier, I said, even for those who are not God-fearing, that is to say, unbelievers, God says even the natural man without an awareness, without knowledge of God, has no excuse for not knowing what is right, walking humbly with God, doing justly, having or loving kindness or being merciful. God puts it this way in Romans 2.14. And stay with me for this. He says, for when Gentiles or when unbelievers, that's people who don't necessarily know God, when Gentiles, who do not have the law, they don't know God's word, by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law unto themselves, who show the work of the law, written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing them witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. I, that's fancy language for every human being. God has given an awareness of what is right and what is wrong. So even when unbelievers, who may not know the word, even when they do what is right, when they are just, when they are merciful, when they are fair, the God is saying they are law unto themselves, meaning they know what is right and even their conscience tells them what is right and what is wrong. The inference here is certainly believers should know because you have the written word of God. So, for any believer who claims to be a God-fearing, believing individual, God is really saying, for you there is no excuse not to love justice, do justly, not to be merciful, and as our emphasis is today, not to walk humbly with God. There's no excuse for you. The people that we're going to cover today, which is very similar to last week's sermon, but you'll stay with me for the difference. The people of God in that day, in Micah's day, we're in the book of Micah today, very similar to Amos. The people then had gone so far from God in sin that they tried to come up with their own way of pleasing God. And God's whole point was, I, was, I already told you what I want. And we'll see how the word brings that out. The Lord's point was spiritual commitment from the heart will lead to right behavior in any human being, and especially those who call themselves believers. This is walking humbly with God. Even James again tells us in James 1.27 what true religion is, helping the widow, 
helping the fatherless, meaning the downtrodden, the more helpless in society. I've often said to you, saints, people falling out and praying 24 hours and jumping the pews and shouting up and down the aisles and gyrating. God says, I didn't ordain that. That's what you like to do. God says true religion is being fair and kind to people. True religion is showing one another love since you don't see God. How can you love God whom you do not see and hate your brother or your fellow citizen whom you see? John reminded us of that in his epistle. So the point is, what are we getting to today? Walking humbly with God, being a true believer in conduct is always manifested by the way you are to others. Those who are hard-hearted and can't forgive, don't I stay, why do I stay on this subject so much? Because the Lord does. The Lord says, the way you were forgiven, that's the way you forgive. The Lord says, the way you want to be treated, do unto others, often called the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have done to you. What am I getting at here? It's fine to know scriptures and be able to quote them and to appear pious and humble, but that is not what the Lord is interested in. The Lord is interested in a sincere heart that is so touched by the awareness of God that when I treat and encounter another human being, I'm going to do what God wants because it is the right thing to do. Men's conference theme, do justly. Love, mercy, or kindness, walk humbly with God. By the way, walk does not mean to physically move your feet. Walk humbly is simply saying live humbly. How do you live humbly with God? That's a rhetorical question. It's easy, the answer is simple. You live humbly, walk humbly with God by submitting yourself to his edicts, to his word, to his admonitions. That's the way we walk or live humbly with God. That's all that means, humbly, walk humbly with God, to live. So how do you live humbly with God? Every day in all that you do, some people will call you a fanatic, the Bible tells you to do it though. It says acknowledge God in all your ways. So everything in life is about God. He's either showing you something, correcting you, uplifting you, uh, turning you back to the right path. Whatever happens in life, unless your mind puts it in that, in that prism of this is God dealing with me, I don't think you're quite yet walking, hum, living humbly with God because you're not letting the word have complete influence in your life. Don't tell me how much you love God, show it by the way you treat another human being. That's what God is saying. Don't I often say, saints, that your best worship, your best worship is not on your knees. Your best praise is not in your song. Your best form of devotion is not in how many hours you worked on this or that. Your best worship, devotion, and praise is the way you are to live, walk humbly with God. And the way you are, because of a spiritual commitment to God's word, will always inevitably manifest itself in how you treat other people. You must... Pay attention to these kinds of uh, scriptures. They're so important. How can you say you love God and be telling the truth is what that's saying. And you've never seen him, yet you hate your brother whom you see. Now, doesn't the word tell you to love one another as Christ has loved us? So words mean nothing. You've heard the expression, talk is cheap. That's a true statement. I don't know who made it, but that's a true statement. Tr talk is cheap. The evidence of walking humbly with God is doing the word of God because you're now showing I am submitted to what God said. Even when it cuts against what I naturally want to do, I say amen to the word of God. Haven't you heard me say over so many years, saints, that usually the right thing to do in most situations, usually, not always, usually, is what is most uncomfortable for you and your natural way. So two people are arguing. 
everyone wants to win. Everyone wants the last word. That's a human condition. But what did Jesus say? Through his word and himself, he says, turn the other cheek, meaning, what was the Lord saying there? He said, don't seek to retaliate. That's all he was saying. He wasn't saying be a punching bag for anybody. He was saying, don't seek to retaliate. Now, it's harder not to retaliate than it is to retaliate because your natural instinct is to strike back. But the spiritual person who walks with God says, what, you know the expression, what would Jesus do? People put it on their bumper stickers and everyone says, yeah, what would Jesus do? Well, that's a true question. Because whatever Jesus would do is what you, is what I should be doing every day. Don't tell me you love the Lord and, and, be, and, and, and put it on the spaces because I go to church every Sunday. I pray every night. Yes, and then no one can stand to be around you because your personality is not inviting. The Lord says, be such a person that exudes Jesus, that shows love, that is merciful. Mercy means not to give what is deserved when it comes to punishment or retribution or whatever it is. It says to love mercy. So to be like the Lord usually is uncomfortable for the natural person. Walking humbly with God means to live in a manner that God has already laid out. And you'll see why I'm stressing already laid out. There's nothing new you need. You may say, but I read the word and I don't understand it. Then go to James 1.5 and see what James already told you. He said, God will let anyone who doesn't understand his word, God will be patient, he giveth liberally, and will abradeth not. He will not be angry with you. You say, Lord, but your word seems so complicated to me. I just don't get it. He said, ask God. God gives understanding to anyone who asks. Now, if when you ask, you're looking to hear what you want to hear, you'll never get it. But if you humble yourself to the word of God and don't be so haughty, don't always want to be right, don't always want to have the last word, let me humble myself and be like Jesus, who could have struck back, but didn't, but left it to God the Father to settle all arguments. Left it to God the Father. Don't strike back. Walking humbly with God means from this very men's conference, saints, each one of you, from this very 66th National Men's Conference, you're going to leave this conference saying, I'm going to be a new person. Now, Someone may say, but I've already been walking with God. Then get better. None of us have reached perfection yet. Didn't it say glory to glory? Every day we're trying to become more and more like Jesus. And that's our mission in life, to become more and more like the Lord. So walking humbly with God is don't, don't use that as just some fancy phrase to say, I walk humbly with God every day. Thank you, Jesus. God's not interested in your word. He's not interested in insincere worship. He's not interested in songs that you sing for your own glory. God is interested in character or behavior that reflects knowledge of him and submission to him, walking humbly with God. Let God be right. Now, it's in his word. Where? It's strewn throughout the scriptures. The example we're going to use today in Micah is really, if you will, a court scene where God calls all of creation, come to court, and I want my lawyer Micah to represent me, the prophet Micah, one of the minor prophets like Amos was. In fact, what, Mike, what Amos was to northern, the northern kingdom, Israel, Micah was to Judah, the southern kingdoms, which encompassed the tribe of Benjamin and the tribe of Judah. All the other ten tribes to the north were considered Israel, though all together, we went through this before, I'm not going to bore you with that again, but altogether, it is Israel. But when the Lord calls in Micah, he calls the whole earth. So he's really calling mankind, not just his people. He calls us, if you will, to court. And God, the plaintiff, brings his case. And I love how he does this. He says, if you will, Micah, be my lawyer, you represent me. And then he calls his creation to witness. And we're going to see that he not only is talking to, then, his people, Israel and Judah, he says, all the earth, all you inhabitants in it, come. 
See if you're walking humbly with God. See if you're measuring up. And I love the point when God gets to the, to the, to the point of, don't, I'm, I'm, let me embellish here. Don't ask me what should I do. I've already told you. And thus, today's title, he has shown you what is good. I'll tell you, for those who keep saying, I, don't, I just don't know what to do, let me ask God. You're really insulting God by saying God has not shown you when he says he already has. In fact, it is really a subtle insult to act like God has not shown mankind already. God has shown us through his word over and over again what it is he requires. And see, the people here were so wicked and turned so much from God that they suggested certain things that God never asked for. And you'll notice in God's answer, God never mentions what it was that they put forth. God, shall we bring you 10,000 this, shall we do? God said, I didn't ask for all that. I say this to bring it into today's understanding, for us today, how does that relate to us? We don't sacrifice rams and goats and lambs and we don't do that anymore, right? So, but what we do is we come and we pray, we worship, we sing, We've been over this before when I talked to Amos, right? And we do all of this worship to God. God says, if it's insincere, I don't want it. If you will, today's sermon is really part two of last week, but it has a different focus. And the focus in today's message, which is Micah to the southern tribes in the kingdom of Judah, that is to say Benjamin and Judah, is Micah's doing what Amos did to the northern ten tribes. He's saying, hey, wake up. Turn to God, but God has already told you what to do. Even today, when mankind says, you know, I really don't know. Romans told you, Romans 2, 14 and 15, said you know it because God gave you a conscience. Everyone knows basic right and wrong. So therefore, you have no excuse, O oh man. But God begins here in Micah. Let's start at the first chapter. And I want you to see how the Lord brings if you will, all of creation, or especially the human beings, I should say, to court. And he calls creation to witness. Why? Because creation, the mountains and the, what he, the winds, they were there when he gave the uh, covenant to Moses. So he's calling again creation to witness God as the plaintiff in this court scene. But let me show you in Michael 1, 1 and 2 how he's calling all the people, not just the Hebrew people, not just Israel, not just Judah, but the whole earth. Listen to this. The word of the Lord that came to Micah of Moresheth in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria, the capital of the northern kingdom, and Jerusalem, the capital of the southern kingdom. So he's calling all of Israel. But listen to this. Hear all you peoples. You see the word peoples? That means everyone on earth. Here, everyone. This is not just for Israel and Judah. Here, all you peoples, listen, O earth, and all that is in it. You're in the earth, so God is saying, listen. Let the Lord God be a witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. So this is God calling a court scene, if you will. And before we get to the main thrust of today's message, I want you to see how God, through his word, which is going to sound very similar to Amos, but notice the focus will be a little different today. God lays out, and we're just going to highlight 10 injustices, 10 wrongs, 10 things he doesn't like, but that the people were doing. So when God highlights them as woe, he's saying it's wrong. So don't say you've never heard what is right and what is wrong. It's been in God's word all along, God's people. God begins in the second chapter now of Micah. Let's jump over to Micah 2, 1. He begins with woe to evildoers. If God is saying woe, which means judgment on your wrong, judgment on evildoers, the 10 that we're going to highlight, I'm going to jump around a bit, but I'll start in the second chapter of Micah. When God says these things are wrong, that means you know what to do or what not to do. So how can you say you've never been told? saying this to the people, but I say the same thing to us today. There's no excuse for any man not to know what is right, especially anyone calling themselves a believer. No excuse for you not knowing when it's been here in the word of God all along. Again, if you say, I don't understand the word when I read it, 
Well, that's why we come to church for clarification and preaching. But let's say you don't have that. James told you in James 1.5, go ask God. He freely gives you understanding if you're willing to be humble and accept God's teaching, which usually will go against your own natural inclinations. But look here in, in uh, Micah, the second chapter, first verse. Woe to those who devise iniquity. That means judgment on you who sit there and think evil. When you're laying in bed, you just think evil, then you wake up and do it because you can, because you have the power. Here's how he puts it. Woe to those who devise iniquity and work out evil on their beds. At morning light, they practice it because it is in the power of their hands. What he is saying is, woe to people who just sit and devise meanness. And then when they get up and they begin an active activities in their life, they just start doing things that, they, that are not right because they can. God says, woe to you. And I want to highlight today 10 particular wrongs or evils that the Lord, through Micah, highlighted to his people. And they're still relevant today because some people are still like that today. Well, many people are. And the Lord is saying to them, listen to me. If I say I don't like these things, that means you shouldn't do them. So you're my people. Saints today, you're, aren't you God's people? If we're his people, we have to amen what God doesn't like. And then that, if, if you know that God doesn't like it, his point is, stop it. So don't say you weren't told what to do. And then don't devise your own scheme as to what you'll do to please God, thinking he'll like that. God's already told you what he wants. The word's going to make that very clear. But let's begin with this. We're going to go to Micah 2.2. This one. It's fraud. He's speaking here of fraud. Listen to this. This is one of the, Ill, the ills or evils that Micah was preaching against and telling the people it's wrong to do this. Listen to this. Now, this first one is fraud. They covet fields and take them by violence, also houses and seize them. So they oppress a man and his house and a man and his inheritance. He's saying, and I, he, here he's talking to the rulers of the people. He's saying, the affluent violated the 10th commandment to covet any man's anything. You don't covet someone else's property, wife, husband, job, position in life, anything. You don't covet anyone's anything. If you read the 10 commandments in Exodus 20, 17, you'll see what I'm talking about. But the affluent were taking advantage of the poor who couldn't defend themselves. And in many cases, they would even go on and kill the man take his inheritance, a man and his heritage or inheritance mean the same thing. He says, fraud is wrong. Now you know that. So we have that, you got that? Micah 2.2, God speaks against fraud. And he's talking here to the rulers, people of influence, people that had influence over other people. They were taking advantage of their positions. God doesn't like it. That's clear. Now, theft, verse eight. Go to verse eight in uh, Micah, the second chapter. Lately, my people have risen up as an enemy. You pull, off the robes with the, you pull off the robe with the garment from those who trust you as they pass by like men returned from war. What does that fancy language means, mean? He is saying, you're robbing people of their coats. As people were passing through their territory of God's people, they were robbing them by taking their outer coats. And he says, as though men were returning from war. When soldiers are returning from war, you expect to return without fighting. War is over. So he's saying, you took advantage. You are taking advantage. And they were doing a lot of robbing of people then. A lot of injustice going on. He says, when you take their coat, it was a, clothes were a big deal back then. It was part of your wealth. Remember Samson had to go get so many changes of garment? Clothes was a sign of wealth. So they were robbing people of their outer garments, their coats. And then they were doing it as they were innocently passing through the territory of Judah, assuming I can pass through peacefully, that's why he says, as though men returning from war. No one's expecting to fight, and here you are taking advantage of others. So God's against theft. Do you see that? This very fancy language, but I'm highlighting only 10 ills. That's uh, Micah 2.8. Now, let's move on to greed, Micah 2.9. The women of my people you cast out from their pleasant houses, from their children you have taken away 
uh, my glory forever. My glory means my blessings from them. Here's what he's saying. Most likely this is a reference to the widows and orphans that were stripped of their, what was rightfully theirs. And if you see in verse 2, go back to verse 2. Because most likely the men were killed. So then they were taking advantage of the women by stripping them of what they had. They were just doing injustice. It's very uh, complicated language here, if you will, but you, if we piece it together, you'll see the Lord is being consistent in what he doesn't like. He doesn't like fraud, Micah 2.2. 2. He doesn't like theft, Micah 2.8. He doesn't like greed. It wasn't, it, they, they, they weren't satisfied with what they did in verse 2. Now they're even robbing them uh, in verse 9. And he says, taking away my glory forever. Whatever God has blessed them with, they were taking that too. These are the rulers, taking advantage of the helpless, of the helpless, I should say, the helpless, the weaker in society. Let's go to number four, verse 11. It speaks here of debauchery. And listen, saints, the language may seem very obscure, but we're going to break it down, Lord willing, as to what it's saying. If a man should walk in a false spirit, and speak a lie, saying, I will prophesy to you of wine and drink, even he would be the platter, even he would be the platter of this people, meaning the one who spews out falsehoods. Now, wine and strong drink speak of debauchery, which usually led to sexual immorality. He is saying, if a man falsely pretends to have the spirit of prophecy, lie, saying, this will never come to pass, but willing to, dis to discourse uh, to them for sensual enjoyment, wine and song, strong drink, the people would accept them, whatever they said. The Lord is saying here, you're giving in to debauchery just because these people are preaching whatever it is you want to hear. The Lord doesn't like that. Let's go to oppression, Micah 3.3. 3. This might be a little complicated to keep up with, but just try to get where I'm, I'll get to the main point in a minute. Who also eat the flesh of my people, flay their skin from them, break their bones, and chop them in pieces, like uh, meat in a pot, like flesh in a cauldron. Now, he's not speaking of cannibalism here. He is saying you are treating the rulers, the people with influence in society in, among his people, were treating their own people so horribly, it was like chopping them up and putting them in a pot or a cauldron and eating them. That's how horribly they were treating these people. And this comes under the, the heading of oppression. God was fed up with those who were advantaged in society, taking advantage of those who had less, who were helpless, and God calls it as though you're cannibalizing them. It's like you're eating them, like you're butchering them. God hates that. So don't say you don't know what God likes and what he doesn't like. Let's go to number six, and this is in uh, Micah 3, 4. He's speaking here of hypocrisy. Micah 3, 4. Then uh, they will cry to the Lord, but he will not hear them. He will even hide his face from them at, the, at that time because they have been evil in their deeds. What he is saying here, when it comes time for the Lord to take retribution on those who have been doing evil, they're going to cry to the Lord, hypocrisy, and act like, Lord, we've always been with you. Have mercy on us, Lord. Didn't Jesus echo this? Some will say, Lord, Lord, we've done this in your name. Jesus is going to say, get away from me. I never knew you. You were never mine. You're a hypocrite. God hates hypocrisy. When it's time for judgment from the Lord to come, people are going to act like, Lord, I've always been with you. I've come to church every Sunday. He says, yeah, but your heart wasn't right. I used to do this. I used to do this for you, Lord. Yeah, but your heart wasn't right. And Jesus went as far as to say, we're gonna, they're going to say, we prophesied in your name. Jesus is going to say, get away from me. You were hypocriting the whole time. What are we, doesn't this sound familiar to this message in Amos? God wants a sincere heart. He hates hypocrisy. It is time for us to learn to walk humbly and honest with God. Judge, doesn't the Bible often say, judge, examine yourself. See if you are sincere. Do you really right now hold in your heart and just won't let go something bitter against someone in, in your very organ, church organization, someone in your family? Don't you often hear me saying, let it go. Didn't God do the same for you? Do you really appreciate what mercy is? Don't be a hypocrite. A hypocrite is one who looks the part, says all the right things, says what people want to hear, but inside you're still harboring ill will against that one or that one. 
And the Lord is saying, take your hypocritical worship and go somewhere. The Lord says, they won't touch me. When it's time for judgment, I won't hear you. All right, that was the sixth. Now we go to verse 5 of, 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 of uh, Micah, the third chapter. And we're speaking here against heresy. Micah 3, 5. Thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who make my people stray. So obviously he means false prophets. Why chant peace while they chew with their teeth? but who, pre who prepare for war against him who puts nothing into his mouth. You know what he just said? Again, it sounds like fancy language. He's saying, you feed those who say what you want to hear, but when someone preaches against you, you don't put food in his mouth. The Lord is he, see, speaking, you endorse heresy. You've often heard me speak of these kind of so-called preachers that preach everything but what's in the Bible. It's heresy. The Lord is saying, he's had it with that. Don't say you don't know what the Lord wants. The Lord doesn't want heresy. He wants people to preach his word as it is. And the Lord is saying here, my people have gone so far astray that they'll feed, they'll give food to, they'll put food in the mouth of those who say whatever they want to hear. But when someone is preaching them the truth, it says in the latter part of verse five, but who put nothing in their mouths, and, and they prepare war against them. Now, haven't I often said it wasn't popular when I started preaching that to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost is not a matter of getting on your knees and repetitively spewing and spouting out the name Jesus. There is no Bible for that. People that say, but it says, call on the name of the Lord, that is a very, take this the right way, it's not an insult, it's a very infantile and totally wrong way of understanding what call on the name of the Lord means. The Lord has made it very clear when you get the Holy Ghost, how you get the Holy Ghost. So when I said that, it wasn't popular, and many got angry, but by the grace of God, I and many of you know how to read what is in the word. And we are told, the moment you honestly repent, turn to the Lord, in honesty, he fills you. He, when I say fills you, he deposits in you his spirit. And then, after you have repented, even the very scripture puts repent first. After you have repented, then you be obedient and find some water and get baptized as an outward testimony that I'm with Jesus. That's why we got baptized, we get baptized in the name of the Lord, in the name of the Lord Jesus, in the name of Jesus Christ, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. John baptized unto repentance to prepare the way of the Lord. We are baptized in the name of Jesus as an identification with the Lord. This is one of the things we are told to do. It is also, listen to this clearly, and this is also not popular for those who don't understand. It is also not a prerequisite for salvation. If water baptism was a prerequisite for water salvation, how did the man on the cross get saved without baptism? These things aren't popular to those who don't understand the word of God, but I must preach it because it's in the word of God. And Paul, the apostle, the great apostle to the Gentiles, makes it very clear that belief in Jesus is what saves you. So when one preaches the, the word, let me read it again, thus says the Lord concerning the false prophets, if you will, who make my people stray, who chant peace. They say peace because that's what people want to hear. Meaning they'll say whatever people want to hear. Who chant peace while they chew with their teeth, they give them something to eat, but who prepare war against him who puts nothing in their mouths. So those who are willing to have the honest word of God preached, will never put up with heresy. We will preach what we know is in the scripture and God doesn't like it when those who call themselves his people succumb to heresy. Now let's go on to uh, the eighth, injustice, God hates injustice. I said we're bringing out 10 particular sins God just can't stand. There are many more, I'm just highlighting 10 today. Here is the ninth, uh, here's the eighth in verse nine of Micah, the third chapter. The Lord says, 
Now hear this, you heads of the house of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel, who abhor justice and pervert all equity. He's saying, hear my word for those of you who are taking bribes, abhor justice. They were taking bribes in order to mete out so-called justice. They were receiving bribes and, and being corrupt when it comes to meeting out just, justice, doing favors to their friends and oppressing the poor. God doesn't like injustice. That's the eighth sin. And then let's move quickly for, for a quick second to chapter 6, where we go to extortion and lying, where you're saying your rich people are violent, your inhabitants are liars, and their tongues speak deceitfully. So he was talking about extortion or obtaining money by force, and he was accusing them that they were accustomed to lying. But he puts it this way in verse, I'll read verses 11 and 12 of Micah, the sixth chapter. Shall I count pure those with the wicked scales? You know how some people, when they buy meats or fruits, they put their thumb on the scale? This is what the Lord is sort of saying, saying here. Shall I count pure? With, uh, shall I count pure those with the wicked scale? scales and with the bag of deceitful weights for her rich men speaking of the, the kingdom her rich men are full of violence her inhabitants have spoken lies and their tongue is deceitful in their mouth so he's saying you're unfair and you lie a lot so wh why am I saying all this we're down to what God doesn't like if God has already shown you what he doesn't like how dare you come up with something you think would please him when he's told you all along what he doesn't like, which means don't do that. So God has already shown us what he doesn't like. Let us go down to the 10th. Now that was extortion and lying. Here's the 10th, it's murder. This is the seventh chapter of Micah, verse two. The faithful man has perished from the earth and there is, and, and there is no one upright among men. They all lie in wait for blood. Every man hunts his brother with a net. That's a Fancy way of saying you kill one another even. Your own brothers, people you know. So what God doesn't like for a quick review of these, uh, let's highlight these 10 sins again. Fraud, theft, greed, debauchery, oppression, hypocrisy, heresy, injustice, extortion and lying, that's number nine, and 10, murder. Now, having said that, let us go to chapter six of uh, Micah. Hear now what the Lord says. Arise, plead your case before the mountains. Now, this is, this is the Lord calling Micah to come be his lawyer. And he's saying, go plead your case. Look at who he's calling as witnesses. Before the mountain and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, O mountains, the Lord's complaint, or controversy, the Lord's complaint, and you strong foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a complaint against his people, you may see the word controversy in, in the original King James. For the Lord has a complaint against his people, and he will contend with Israel, or plead. In other words, the Lord is bringing a case, and look at who he called his witnesses, his creation. The mountains and the hills, the foundation of the earth. The Lord is saying, Micah, go plead my case. And this is the case that Micah takes up on behalf of the Lord, who is the plaintiff here. The Lord God is bringing a case. Why is he doing that? He's calling mankind, not just Israel, not just Judah. He's speaking to you, to me today. He's calling mankind to account. Be aware of what it is you're all about. If you love God, do what he wants, not what you made up. See, human beings have a way of coming up with something in their mind and thinking that's what God likes. We're going to see that as we read here. This is God now, this is Micah speaking on behalf of God. This is what God feels. Oh, my people, God says, what have I done to you? Again, for a quick review, for those that may not be up on the history, Israel, the northern 10 tribes, and Judah, the southern two tribes, had gotten so wicked that God brings them to court, if you will. He's also talking to us today. But he brings them to court saying, my people, what have I done to you? Why have you turned against me? Why erect these altars to these false gods? Why are you so brutal with one another? You kill each other. You extort one another. You are unfair. You put your, your thumb on the balances. You're not even fair in your dealings with one another. 
You believe heresies and false preachings, and I left you what I want in my word. No one has to add to it. No one has to take from it. Don't I often say that? You know, I hope you noticed in the prayer that we just did recently for this men's conference that I stuck to the example, the template given in the scripture. When God has given us, look at all the Psalms and so many other places. When God has given us a format, a way of praying, why create your own? Who said, listen to this and please take this the right way? Because we were all ignorant once and we've grown now. But who said that when you anoint someone's head, that they had to go flopping and jumping around? Where did that come from? Read that in the Bible. The worship that God wants, I know many of you like it, so you're going to think I'm the bad guy again. But I'm telling you what God wants. And what God is saying here to his people, I've given you already what I want. I told you, pray to me with a sincere heart. I said, stop showing off. God doesn't care about the, oh, God, God doesn't care about all that screaming and showmanship. Remember Jesus witnessed the old woman who gave her last little money, the honest heart? God's not interested in the ones, I have a million dollars to give to the church and wants the big trumpets and all that. God says, you can take all that because you're getting praise. God has shown us through his word throughout history all he wants from mankind is for us to walk humbly with him, submit to what he's already given us in his word. How should we act with one another? Like Jesus did. He was always gracious, always kind, loving, forgiving over and over and over again. And even when uh, Philip, show us the Father, and that will suffice, Jesus, in a ju have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? You see, Jesus? Jesus was always gentle, willing to receive the honest heart and sorrowful repentance. When you ask for forgiveness, he, was always, he still is. God is not interested in all your show of uh, glamour and Christian showmanship. God's not interested in that whatsoever. Human beings are. God wants a sincere, contrite heart with spiritual commitment which will manifest itself in right behavior. Right behavior will always ensue or follow when the heart has been cut by the word of God. All the showmanship, God says keep that. All the insincere worship, listen, all your pretty singing, playing, and your fancy uh, givings, and all, God is not impressed with that whatsoever. God wants that humble, little, quiet heart, and I don't mean false piety. I mean a sincere heart that knows it is under the direction and control of God. God runs everything. He's in control. He's already left us what he wants. You don't have to come up with something new, Judah, Israel, the people. You don't have to create. God's already told you what he wants. Let me read you something, and I hope... I hope this hits home, and I wrote this down so I'd get it all right. The work of God, the worship, I said, the worship of God is the, is the subject of what has been revealed, not what we might invent or come up with. True religion is not a new design showing each person's taste, but a copy from a plan framed and fixed by the Lord himself. We are to follow the well-defined path, not map our own course. God what is that saying? God is not interested in you coming up with something new for him to please him. God says, I already told you what I want. Today's title, he has shown you what is good. God has already done it. Don't sit here and insult God by saying, we don't know what to do. What should we do to please God? God says, I've already told you. Where have you told us, Lord? In his word. Well, if you don't read it, how do you know what's in it? Then if you do read it, do you submit to it? Do you walk humbly with God? Walking humbly with God is letting him lead. If you want to use another metaphor, we're in this dance of life. And in this dance, you know when two partners dance together, you know two can't lead? One has to lead, the other has to follow. God is leading this dance. And God is saying to his partner, 
you, me. He's saying, let me lead. I've already shown you what I want. God has already done that. Don't insult him by saying, but you haven't shown me, Lord. Someone says, but it's in, and we will say, and I tell you, it's in his word, but I don't understand his word. Then go to James 1.5. He says, ask him. He'll make it clear what his word means. Now let's get back to Micah, the sixth chapter. God bringing a case against his, pe- a case against his people. Oh, my people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? God says, I'm getting on your nerves. How have I tired you out? Look at this. Testify against me, God says. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt. Now God begins, as we did in Amos, God begins to remind his people, I've blessed you. As I'm saying again today, and you'll see, I've been hinting at it already, even the title suggests where we're going today. But God, the point he's making here is, I have blessed you. I brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Let us bring it to today. God has brought us out of the misunderstandings of the past, and he's brought us so far that we should now be manifesting that growth, and many of us are, let me say for the record. Many of us are, thank God for that growth. But not all are. So thus the word goes on. God has blessed us. He's brought us up out of Egypt, metaphorical Egypt. I redeemed you from the house of bondage. He said, I brought you out of slavery. I remember, and you won't, many will agree with me, we were enslaved in a notion of how to be saved. And many of us, if you're honest, I know of my generation, came to the conclusion that if I'm in the tribulation, how did we ever get there? If I'm in the tribulation, I'm going to have to be decapitated because there's no way I can be saved. This is what we thought. But God brought us up out of that ignorance, of that misunderstanding. We now know that once we're in Christ, there's no way we can't be saved. We now know that being in Christ means I'm already seated in glory. He brought us up out of the house of bondage. We were enslaved in that ignorance. Thank God, and all the saints say with me, thank God for growth in the word of God. God says, I brought you up out of ignorance, the house of bondage in this case. I sent, be- and look, he says, I even sent you leaders. I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. And ladies, I like the way he threw that in there too. You see, ladies, even the Lord says, I sent you leaders. I, I brought you up out of bondage, and then I, sh- I gave you uh, heads and leaders to, to conduct your way to show you what to do. God used Ar- uh, Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. God says, I sent you leaders, O my people, remember. Now, he's saying, remember now what Balak, king of Moab, counseled, and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him uh, from Acacia Grove to Gilgal. He just mentioned three things there that, or if, if not four, how he blessed them. He says, remember how Balak wanted to kill you? Remember he sent out Balaam to go curse you? And remember how I saved you every time he tried to curse you? All he could say is, how lovely are your tents, O Jacob, and your tabernacle, O Israel. The Lord is saying, even when you were about to be cursed, I made that false prophet speak the truth, even when he wanted to curse you. And when the king, when uh, Balak wanted to pay Balaam, who loved the wages of sin, who he, he paid him to curse you, God says, I made his mouth bless you. Do you remember that? Then he says, I miraculously parted the Jordan. You'll read then say, I didn't see the word Jordan in there. From Acacia Grove to Gilgal means from the eastern side to the western side of the Jordan. Remember when I miraculously opened the Jordan up so you could cross on in? That's what the Lord is saying to his people. In other words, look at how I blessed you. So how have I wearied you? How am I getting on your nerves, God is saying. I've done nothing but bless you. This is the Lord's case. Although he's the plaintiff, it almost sounds like he's a defendant. He's def- it almost sounds like he's defending himself. But the Lord is saying, you should be grateful, my people. But now you say, I'm a burden to you, the Lord is saying. How have I wearied you? Testify against me if you have anything, the Lord is saying. Then he goes on to say how he blessed them through verses 4 and 5. He says, with what, now, this is what uh, the people are saying, and this is where Micah assumes the position of the people. And this is what the whole sermon today is about. God has already shown you what he doesn't like. If he's shown you what he doesn't like, that means you know what he does like. 
He's shown you he doesn't like debauchery, heresy, hypocrisy, cruelty to one another, injustice. So what does he do? What does he like? He likes justice. He likes mercy. He likes when you're humble enough to let him lead when you walk humbly with God. That's what he likes. But now here in verse 6, Micah assumes the position of the people answering God because this is what the people were feeling. The people were saying, with what shall I come before the Lord? Now, what do you mean with what? The Lord's already told you. But this is an arrogant or misguided, sinful people who want to do things their way and not follow the template set down by God. Where? In all of his word. And especially in this particular book, because Micah brought to them the judgments or the woes against them, things God didn't like. This is what the people are saying now. With what shall I come before the Lord, verse 6, Micah 6, 6. And how, uh, and, and, and with what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Now that right there is a bit of an insult. Because what the people are saying is, we don't know what to do to please God. How does this apply to us today? Some are saying, I don't know what I should do to please God. And it's been there in his word all along. But I don't understand when I read the word. Again, I say, go to James 1.5. Ask the Lord, and he will make it clear. But here you see the people are clearly saying, with what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? As if he hasn't told them already. Now listen, here is where I said, worship of God is not a matter of, of something you come up with, it's already been revealed. But this is the people trying to come up with their own. How can I liken it to today? It's people that do things, in, and you see it all the time, in churches that God never asked for. I hate to keep beating this dead drum because it's a sickening one, but that miracle spring water. When did, read one scripture where God said, go get miracle spring water and pour it over your bills and pour it on your car and pour it on yourself. Now, where does he say do that? Miracle spring water. Why come up with, uh, why try to come up with a way to please God or worship God or appeal to him when he's already told you? Listen to this. The people are saying, with what shall we come before this high God? With a calf, with, with calves a year old, that's a very special, tender veal. Uh, will the Lord be pleased with a thousand rams? The Lord didn't ask you for that. Why, why are you coming, why are you asking that? 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgressions, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul? Do you see what the people are doing here? They're really insulting God by trying to come up with things that they think would please God when look at God's answer. Look at God. This is Micah speaking on behalf of God. He has shown you, meaning already. He has shown you, O oh man, what you should do. He's shown you what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God? Notice in that answer, God never mentioned that he wanted 10,000 rams. He never mentioned that he wanted rivers of oil. He never mentioned that he wanted young calves. He never mentioned what the people imagined would please God. But notice God's uh, very, very curt answer through Micah. God says, I already told you. And this is where we come to the meat of what we're saying today. There's no excuse for any so-called believer not to know what pleases God. You ought to know. God says, of, and then someone will say, but didn't he say, do this sacrifice and do these sacrifices? God says, yes, but all those sacrifices were only a harbinger pointing to Jesus coming. His whole point here is the blood of lambs and the rams and the thousand rivers of oil does nothing for God. God was through all of those uh, pictures and symbols showing us and getting us ready for, human beings ready for, the coming of Christ. God is saying here, as James makes it very clear what true religion is, is to be fair, do justly. Help the downtrodden, the widow, the orphan. Why? Because they were the most vulnerable and helpless in society. But you can extrapolate that out to help those who are less fortunate. That's what he loves. Now, what else does he love? What does he want from you? Love, kindness, or mercy. 
Withhold the ax. You, cannot, you don't always have to chop someone. Withhold it. Love mercy. And don't do it begrudgingly. Love to do it. Because God does. And what else does he want from you? He didn't ask you for rivers of oil. He didn't. What does he want? Walk humbly with God. Shall we review again what that means? Acknowledge everything about the word of God is true. Let us leave this 66th National Men's Conference with this understanding. That, and in fact, let me read James for you. This, this has to be read. Uh, what is it, James 127, I believe. People like to, I always say, jump the pews, run down the aisle, flop like a flounder. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's what you like. You can't find one scripture where that was ever done. God says, pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this, to visit the orphans and widows, meaning to help the less fortunate in society, in their trouble, and keep oneself unspotted from the world. What, that's another way of saying what I always said. Just don't sin. God loves us to do justly by one another. What does that mean? Be fair. Let's put it in the vernacular. Be a nice person. Be a nice guy. And then be merciful. What is that? another way of saying that? Don't retaliate. That's what Jesus meant by turn the other cheek. Don't retaliate. Now, he's not saying if someone has done crimes, you can't justly seek retribution legally and justly. His point is don't retaliate. Be merciful. And then there was the last thing in Micah 6, 8 God requires of you. It's simple. I like the way God is putting this. God says it's very simple. I don't want young calves. That might be tantamount today that you can keep all your money. I don't want a thousand rams. I don't want rivers of oil. All these things were very precious back then. So whatever you consider precious today, God says keep that. God says what I want from you is a spiritual commitment with a changed heart, which will always manifest itself in behavior that is godlike, that will always ensue, follow, when someone has made a true and honest spiritual commitment to God and his ways. At this men's conference, let us live out for the rest of our lives the theme which I love straight out of the Bible, out of the book of Micah. Do justly, be fair. Love mercy, don't retaliate. Walk humbly with God. Submit to every word of God. Even when you don't understand, ask him for understanding. But always acknowledge God in all that you do. And as James said, pure and, and righteous and upright religion and undefiled is to help the helpless and to keep yourself from sin. That's the true, true definition of walking humbly with God. God bless you all and peace be unto you.